are just discussing Nelson's hidden variable theory. And so for the moment, we don't even talk about quantum mechanics. I just wanted to remind you of the basics of stochastic processes. And the kinds of stochastic processes we are considering are just Brownian motion, maybe adding a drift field. So sometimes you call that a drift diffusion process. And kinds of questions you can ask is, for example, what is the stationary probability density that develops? So if I want to draw a picture of such a process, that would be space versus time. And then, for example, it has this fractal appearance, typical for Brownian motion, and it goes up and down. But this is already uh, a process that has a tendency to go back to the origin, because otherwise it would just evolve ever further from the origin. And so last time I ended with the example of an Einstein-Huenbeck uh, stochastic process. But more generally, um, the types of processes we describe are always subject to the following equation, where first I will write down the discrete version, and then I will write down the um, continuum version. So x at time t plus delta t is just the old position x of t plus some random step in either direction, which I call delta x of t, plus then possibly some deterministic drift. So you have a velocity depending on the current position and multiply that by the time step. Or you can also write it down in a continuum version if you imagine the idealization that delta t tends to zero and uh, do the limits correctly, you would say dx over dt equals something uh, that derives from this noise process. So we have called it v tilde of t, that would be a noisy velocity field, which is really white noise that we discuss, plus um, v of x of t, that's the deterministic drift term. So noise and drift. And we also mentioned that, of course, somehow you want to characterize the strength of the noise. For example, you can take the variance of delta x. Um, and in order to get a reasonable limit, you will take that variance of delta x to be proportional to delta t. So we said variance of delta x equals 2 times d times delta t. And d then would be the diffusion constant. Or if you want to describe it in this continuum version, you would say v tilde of t, v tilde of zero, the correlator of this um, is also it's just a delta function, and that's uh, depending on this diffusion constant. Okay. Now, one of the questions, as I said, you can ask is, if I let the trajectory start at any point and wait for a long enough time and just register the probability for the particle to visit any small interval, I will then find there will be a steady state probability density. And so one of the tasks is to find the steady state probability density. So typically, in the following, I will call this rho, rho of x and t for the moment. But we will then consider stationary processes where this settles down to some steady state value. So um, how does this probability density evolve? Well, there is the deterministic drift that just carries along the particles of your imaginary ensemble and it gives rise to a current density which is just rho times the drift velocity. And so that gives the first term minus the divergence of this current density which is rho times v. So that would be the drift. Plus, there is an extra term, because even in the absence of drift, of course, the probability density does change. 
via the noise term. So it diffuses. You start from a very localized probability density and it diffuses outward. And so that is described by the diffusion term D times the second derivative of rho. You see the second derivative in the center is negative, so it gets suppressed and in the outward fringes it's positive. Okay, so that is drift and diffusion. Now, I want to figure out the stationary probability density that the system settles into, so I demand that rho does not change anymore. And so I have to solve this equation, the right-hand side being zero. Now, luckily, I find that the right-hand side can be written as a derivative. So derivative being zero means it's just constant, equal to some constant. And so in order to be normalizable in the end, this has to be zero. Now, that then means if I just uh, bring rho times v to one side, I would have dx rho over rho equals uh, the velocity divided by the diffusion constant. Okay. So, some of the, given the drift velocity, I immediately know the derivative of rho. And if you look at it, this is just the derivative of the logarithm of because that would give you 1 over rho and then you still differentiate rho. So this immediately gives you an equation that tells you um, how rho should behave. And then for example, um, if the velocity, the drift velocity can itself be written as a derivative. Because for example, you think of an overdamped particle and the velocity is just mobility times the force, and the force is minus the gradient of some potential, uh, then things can be even more simplified because then you have some derivative equals another derivative. So let's just very briefly go through this because that is what you encounter if indeed you consider an overdamped particle moving in some potential. Noise term. 
Nevertheless, you want to do something like this, and for example, you say, okay, let me just take the derivative at some point, then of course it has these strong fluctuations, but let me then average out these fluctuations, and hopefully I will just get the drift term. This is the kind of reasonable question you can ask. And the point I want to make now is that you can do this, but you have to be very, very careful of how you actually define things. And there are various ways of defining things, uh, which will then result in different outcomes that differ even by the sign. And so we want to learn about this because then, after we have learned about this, we will be even more ambitious and instead of just defining a suitably defined uh, instantaneous velocity, we will want to ask about an instantaneous acceleration. So x of t plus delta t equals x plus, say. 
just some value. And again, I apply my definition, I would say that's delta x of t times the delta function that enforces the constraint. divided by um, the expectation of the delta function alone. Okay, now you see that this is more difficult because, well, delta x of t was independent of x of t, but certainly um, the value of x of t plus delta t was obtained by adding to x of t delta x of t, so somehow they are no longer uncorrelated. I have to be careful here. So let me just write down the equation that we took to take the single step of our random process. x of t plus delta t is x of t plus delta x of t plus v of x of t times delta t. Now, it will turn out that not all of these terms matter because this term I should consider to be of order square root of delta t since the variance goes like delta t. Whereas that term is already of order delta t, so if delta t goes to zero, this term is relatively speaking less important and I can drop it. Of course, when I first do this uh, calculation, I don't drop it and I will just see that in the end it drops out, but just believe me. Okay, so now. I look at this delta function and I rewrite it in terms of uh, this equation. So I would say up to this approximation that we just made this is the same as the delta function of x of t plus delta x of t minus x plus. And now, since in the end I'm interested in averaging this after taking the product with delta x of t, and of course I feel that the delta x of t inside here will be correlated with the delta x of t in front of the delta function, um, I want to pull this out, which I will be able to do if you allow me to do a Taylor series in this. Now, of course, that's a little bit dangerous, I know, because that is a very sharply peaked function, obviously, but it is to be understood in the sense that this is always done with delta functions, that this will be good under an, in an, under an integral if it's multiplied with a very a smooth function. And that will be the case because taking the expectation value is taking the integral with a smooth uh, density. So, okay, so that's the next uh, point where a mathematician would have grave concerns. So that would be delta of x of t minus x plus. That's everything except the delta x. Plus delta x times the derivative. other terms. So now I can go ahead and evaluate my expectation value of delta x times the constraint. And I will find the following. First, from this first term, get something like delta x of t times the delta function, the simple delta function. And you see, again, I can say uh, this is uncorrelated with that per assumption, so I can factorize, and delta x average is just zero. Okay. So that is the easy part. That would not change anything. But then there's the other part coming from the second term where we took the derivative. And then, of course, I get delta x of t squared times the derivative of the delta function. Now, you see, that's more interesting because the average of delta x squared at least doesn't give zero. It gives, per definition, two times the diffusion constant times delta t. Now you might say, okay, delta t will go to zero, but when I want to apply this formula, I'll actually be dividing by delta t. So that is an important term to keep. Now what is this expectation value of the delta function uh, differential applied to x of t minus x plus? Well, you better just work it out you take the integral over all possible values that x of t, the value of the random process at t that x of t might have. You of course have to weight with the probability distribution and here I'm assuming we are already in the stationary state, so it's just rho evaluated at x of t. And then I just plug in my delta function derivative. 
Okay, and now you see what happens. I can do an integration by parts and take the derivative from the delta function to the density. And afterwards, I just use the delta function to evaluate the remaining integrand at just a single point, at x of t equals x plus. And so, in the end, I will just get, so all of this integral will just be the derivative of the density, the stationary density of my random process, evaluated at uh, x of t, or, or evaluated at x plus, because that's what the delta function enforces. Okay. So now you see you have this funny extra term, simply because we asked for a slightly different expectation value of the same random variable, but under a different constraint. And so maybe let me just write down the result here. What then is the expectation value under this constraint? I still have to divide by this delta function. But when I evaluate it, and here it's enough to go to leading order, I will just get the density evaluated at x plus. So what I get is the expectation value of delta x of t given the constraint that x of t plus delta t equals some value is nothing but minus twice the diffusion constant times delta t times the derivative of rho divided by rho itself. So that's just what mathematics tells you. And now we want to apply this because now we want to take uh, uh, the derivative of our random process. Gives a finite contribution that scales like delta t. Okay. 
And so that is what we have to take care of. And so that is, if we follow the above result, minus 2 times diffusion constant, rho prime at x plus, divided by rho at x plus, plus v of x plus. And now this still looks a little bit mysterious, but if you remember the relation between the density, the stationary density, and the drift field, it just turned out that, so this rho prime divided by rho was nothing but the drift field divided by d. Yeah. And so the d cancels, I get minus twice the drift velocity plus the drift velocity, so in the end it turns out I just get minus the drift velocity. So that's funny, isn't it? Because I'm just taking the same different quotient, I'm just taking a slightly different constraint. If this were a purely deterministic uh, process, it wouldn't matter. So that is what happens, and you can draw a picture which makes it reasonable that this is what should happen. So again, x versus t. Well, and I'm drawing the picture in a suggestive manner so that <laughs> this turns out to be reasonable. Okay, so what really happens is, um, say I fix this point, and either then I can take the difference quotient by taking a point that is at larger times, and taking the slope and then averaging over the fluctuating slope. This is the first formula. Or I can take another point at smaller times, then take the slope, and then again average over the fluctuating slope, always keeping this middle point fixed. And the results will be different. Um, which is sort of suggested by my picture somehow. Here, if you go forward in time, you are bound to, on average, go closer to the origin, at least if you think of this constant moving back process where the velocity is actually negative. Um, that sounds reasonable. Now, why is it that if you go backward in time, you also go towards the origin? And the reason is that simply here, the probability density was much greater than out there. So if I tell you, you are now at this point, it is very, very likely that you just came from smaller values of the coordinate, because there are so many more points down here, so many more members of this imaginary ensemble fluctuating down here than up there. So it's a matter of likelihood where you came from. Also, it nicely respects somehow the symmetry in time. This is an old argument even going back to Boltzmann's times. Yeah, um, What would happen if you reverse things in time? And so apparently both if you go forward in time and if you go backward in time, the average velocity will always point on. So there's no asymmetry in time if you define it like this. Okay. So, that's already interesting. At least it tells you you have to be careful in these manners. And now it also tells us, apparently when we take the time derivative in the sense of taking an average but keeping the current point fixed, there are two versions. I can go forward in time or I can go backward in time and the results will be different. And so you can work this out a little bit more generally, you can ask the following. Let's say I have an arbitrary function of my random process, maybe also depending explicitly on time. Of course, f of x of t again is a random process. For example, the square of my original random process. And now I want to take a time derivative, but again, I have to be careful. I want to do it in this manner. Um, but I have to specify whether I go forward in time or backward, so I put a little arrow in there. So the arrow pointing to the right for me means I go forward in time. Then I would just take uh, the difference quotient, evaluate it um, by taking a step forward. And then, of course, in the end, I will send that at t to zero. Um, and I will evaluate it at x of t being fixed. 
better to do, to do it this way. First, evaluate the expectation value, then take the limit. Okay. Now that would be the formal derivative, and we can also have the other version. And now, I always want to keep x of t fixed to make these formulas look more symmetric. If I do this, then um, here I still want to go one step back in time, so I will take t to be the larger point in time, and then I have to subtract x of t minus delta t. So you see this is just slightly changing the notation such that I make sure that it's always x of t that I keep fixed. Here I once kept fixed x of t and x of t plus delta t. But still it's the same idea. So these are the two different kinds of derivatives that you can define for such a random one. And so now let me write down the result. Maybe still here. If you work that out as carefully as we did there, then you'll find the following. And I will only write it down for a stationary process that is already stationary. Otherwise, it's uh, slightly more difficult. I will not go into that. And so the result is the following. I have the forward. of any function of my random process and that happens to be well first taking the diff, um, taking the time derivative with respect to the explicit time dependence that's not so surprising plus well even if I only have the deterministic drift I know that I have to take the derivative of f with respect to x and then multiply by the time derivative of x, which would be v, the drift. So there is something like this advective term, uh, v, and then the derivative with respect to x applied to f. Plus, this is a new term now, if you go through it carefully, you find because x diffuses, there is a second derivative. Again, this makes a lot of sense, and all of this is applied to f. So this term didn't appear in our calculation now because we only took the uh, time derivative of x of t itself and then the second derivative with respect to x to vanish. Okay, so that is the forward derivative. And we can also have the backward derivative, which is practically the same, except that we get a minus sign in two places. So the first minus sign is the one we just found, and the second minus sign you would then get out if you do the careful analysis. Okay, so this is one thing. Now, the one conceptual point I want to make is um, you start with some random process. I mean, x of t is a random process. You take some arbitrary function of the random process. It's still a random process. You take the time derivative in this manner, first keeping x of t the value fixed, but then you again get a function that depends on x of t. So all of this is again a random process, yeah? which somehow makes sense. Conceptually, you take the time derivative of a random process in this manner, it's still a random process. I wanted to make this point because in the course of doing the derivative, you do take an expectation value, but you take it given the value of x of t is fixed, so it becomes a function of this value, 
And then again, you let the value of 3D fluctuate according to your random process. So the time derivative, again, is a random process, which is nice because it means now we can apply this time derivative a second time. This tells me how to take a time derivative of a random process. I still get a random process. I can do it again. And of course, taking a time derivative twice means taking the acceleration. So, now then, let's define the acceleration of such a drift diffusion process. And again, I will draw a picture, x versus t. I might have something like this. And then an einstein uhlenbeck process, for example, has always the tendency to go back to the origin. Now, okay, I want to define the acceleration at some point, for example, here. It might be a nice exercise for you to just imagine whether you think that the acceleration is negative or positive. Actually, it's not so easy. And I will tell you that it depends on the definition. Um, but let's see. So we want to take the definition that Mr. Nelson takes, and which is somehow very reasonable because it's very symmetric. Now, the point is, okay, I want to take the second time derivative of x of t. But we have learned there are two types of time derivatives, forward and backward. And so now I could take twice the forward derivative or twice the backward derivative, but some of the symmetric compromises to take the forward and the backward derivative. And actually to do it in a, in a symmetrized manner, so I would have, say, dt forward, d over dt backward, plus uh, the other way around. So that is the kind of acceleration we want to look at. So that's a definition. As I said, there is some ambiguity here. If you were to just take twice the forward derivative or twice the backward derivative, actually the results would switch sign. Okay. But at least that is not an unreasonable, unreasonable definition and the ambiguity is not that great. Good. So, one thing that will also be important for us is, now this of course is again a random process. I can view it as a function of time, but I can also say, well, wait, um, I can say now this becomes a function of x of t. At least I can try to express it as a function of x of t. In that sense that I then get an acceleration field in the same sense that I have a drift velocity field. Okay. So, now we can actually work this out by applying the formulas that I gave you. Uh, with the forward and backward derivatives expressed through the explicit time derivative, the um, drift term v d over dx, and the diffusion term d and the second time derivative. Uh, second space to the And we have to apply this twice after each other. And so what is the result? Well, again, I will only write down the result for a stationary process because that makes things a little bit simpler. And what we find is the following. A, now you think of it as a function of x, equals minus v of x dx applied to v of x minus the diffusion constant times the second derivative of the drift field. So this is then the expression that relates the acceleration to the drift field. So if you give me the drift field and the diffusion constant, you have fully specified the process, so it's no wonder that I can then express my acceleration via the drift field. Okay, 
Let's just apply it to a simple example. For example, take our Einstein Winback process. And just to remind you, there we had a drift field that was always pointing back to the origin with some constant gamma in front. And so if you insert that, well, you see there is no second derivative of this drift field. Only that term uh, will contribute. The derivative here just gives me minus gamma. Here again, I get another minus gamma. There's another minus in front, so in total there is a minus. And I get an acceleration minus gamma squared times x. Which again is negative, it's pointing back towards the origin. So this uh, symmetrized definition of the acceleration gives you an acceleration that for the einstein uhlenbeck process turns you back to the origin. Which somehow makes sense as reasonable. Okay. Now you could amuse yourself by now going through all the different kinds of drift diffusion processes that you like and calculating the acceleration. But we want to turn the game on its head and we want to instead say I'm given the acceleration field. Please find the drift diffusion process, that is, please find the drift field that produces this acceleration. That's also a reasonable question. Okay, so that's our new game. And again, this is a game that in principle Einstein and Smolochowski could have played a hundred years ago if they had been bold enough to introduce a proper definition for the acceleration of a random process. And uh, then they could have uh, asked themselves, well, how do I produce a given acceleration field? Now, we want to make it even a little bit more special. That is, we want to consider an acceleration field that can be written as the gradient of something, the gradient of a potential. And the reason is simply taking inspiration from Newton's theory, you know, m times a is the force, and the force for a conservative potential is just minus the gradient of the potential. So that is also what we want to consider now in our game. An acceleration field that would be exactly equivalent to what you would expect for a classical Newtonian particle. Only, of course, here the particle is not moving in the fashion that you expect a Newtonian particle to move because it has all these random fluctuations. Still, its acceleration, its mean acceleration, so to speak, in the sense defined here, should equal the Newtonian force. Okay. Now, that becomes an exercise in mathematics, yeah? because I can just take this prescribed acceleration field, plug it in into the left hand side and try to solve for v of x. So let's do it. So I drop the minus sign on both sides and then I get 1 over m derivative of u equals v dx v plus d times the second Now, let's have a look at this term, v dx v, this effective term, so to speak. Yeah? Um, I can say, well, this is just what I would get if I apply the derivative to one half v squared. So v squared derivative is 2 times v times the derivative of v. So that makes things a little bit simpler. And then I can insert it into this equation and you see immediately what happens. Suddenly everything, both on the left and right hand side, again is a derivative. And so everything is equal up to some constant. So 
That would mean the following. Let me also multiply everything with the mass. Then I would get, by bringing everything to the left hand side, minus m of v squared, that's what originates from this term that I just explained, minus m times the diffusion constant times derivative of the drift field, plus u, the derivative has gone because uh, I found the derivative of everything equals uh, zero, so everything equals to some constant. So that's just another equation. It look, looks a little bit like energy conservation, not quite, because uh, the signs would be wrong, but okay. And uh, still, it's rather complicated because it is a nonlinear differential equation, um, which I don't know easily how to solve in general for an arbitrary potential. Let's say. Okay, now the next step will be to turn this equation for the drift field into an equation for my density. The two are related that we already know. So, for the stationary process I have V, the drift field, is just the diffusion constant times the derivative of log rho of X. That's the first step, but instead of looking at the density rho, I want to look at the square root of the density, because it just turns out that for this nonlinear differential equation, that is a very useful trick to do the solution. So, um, I will define rho of x equals the square of the square root, and the square root of the density I will call the sum. So now, if I apply the formula above, this is just, okay, the logarithm of psi squared is twice the logarithm of psi, so there's a factor of 2 coming out, and then just dx log psi, and that is just the same as twice d times dx psi over psi. Okay, so far so good. That's a, just a little transformation. Now I have to insert it into my equation for the drift field. So I insert this expression and already express everything by upside. And I find the following. So there's the first term that was like the kinetic energy, m half v squared with a minus sign in front. V I express in this manner, and so what I get is the following, minus 2 times m d squared ds psi over psi squared. Okay. Now, then, there was the other term that already included the diffusion constant and um, the derivative of the drift field. So if I insert my definitions, it's minus 2m d squared derivative applied to dx psi over psi. And then there is the potential, and everything is equal to some constant. Now, if I apply this derivative to this quotient, 
I will just get once the second derivative, but also I have to apply the derivative to 1 over psi, which gives minus 1 over psi squared times the derivative, so the derivative in total will appear squared but with a minus sign. And now you see that something interesting happens. This rather complicated looking term in front completely cancels that rather relatively complicated looking term. So what I remain with then miraculously turns out to be a linear uh, equation for Psi. So what I did now is also to multiply everything with Psi because Psi had been everywhere, everywhere in the denominator. And I would now propose that D equals H bar over 2M. It has to have some value, right? And now at this point I want to stop for a minute of reflective silence. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, you realize that now this has become the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And, uh, by the way, the constant on the right would then correspond to E. And so, it's really useful at this point to stop and again ask ourselves, what have we done? So the Schrödinger equation appears automatically. In a derivation that could have been done a uh, hundred years ago if people had been even more interested in random processes. And so, in a summary, our task was simply to find a process with a specified acceleration field, namely the one you would expect from Newtonian physics, minus gradient U divided by the mass, and setting D to have some value h bar over 2m. And the result after some mathematical manipulations has been that the rule, the, the most efficient way of finding these processes is actually to solve the stationary Schrödinger equation for this particular potential, u of x and that particular mass. And then to consider all the stationary solutions of the Schrödinger equation, each belonging to a different energy, or the different energy eigenfunctions, and saying or claiming that all processes with their densities being equal to the, set, to the square of these um, eigenfunctions fulfill the condition. So the first surprise maybe is that there is more than one process. I mean, for a given drift field, you only have one process. But for a given acceleration field, there's infinitely many processes that can produce this acceleration field. Then maybe let's discuss briefly the ambiguities in the derivation, because that's, at least for me, the only point the only example I know where you derive the Schrödinger equation from an ansatz that does not in any obvious way smuggle in the Schrödinger equation from the start. Because there was the ambiguity in the definition of the acceleration. You could have taken another definition, then things would have been off by a sign. Okay. 
but that's not a huge ambiguity. Yeah? And the definition we adopted was somewhat reasonable. And then, of course, you have to set the diffusion constant equal to h bar over 2m. Probably the way you would uh, phrase this if you had first come up with this, and that would have been the way that quantum mechanics had developed, would be to say, aha, we have learned that nature is described by these diffusion processes. It turns out that just by looking at the experiments, the diffusion constant has to be inversely proportional to m. And the constant in front of the 1 over m is a universal constant, and let's call it h bar half. Yeah. That's how you would have phrased it. And so this is uh, something which Nelson figured out and published in 1966. Okay. Maybe let's just apply it to an example and then also see it in an American simulation. Now the example I want to take is simply free motion. Yeah, that's the simplest example. Maybe you imagine a large box, if you like. Okay, so we know that all the standing waves are solutions the stationary Schrodinger equation, even with arbitrary wavelength, unless you fix the box, but even if when you make the box larger and larger, uh, you can uh, vary the wavelength uh, ever more finely grained. So, all standing waves are solutions. And so, of course, if we talk about the random process, we don't talk about psi anymore. That was just a smart way of finding the solution. I would rather plot, say, the density as a function of x. And then it would look like this. And the claim is that this random process, which has such a funny density, still has the acceleration field exactly equal to zero everywhere. Now, um, we can also define the, or what, we can also draw the velocity field somehow, the drift field. Um, and we have to think about what is the purpose of the drift field anyway? The purpose is the following. If I just have the diffusion term and I put some particles in here, they would just leak outwards and diffuse everywhere and in the end I would have a constant density. Apparently, I don't have a constant density here, so the drift field has to counteract this tendency. And so, for example, if you are here, the drift field has to point to the right, and if you are here, it has to point to the left. And we know that the um, drift field is the uh, derivative of rho, uh, or it's the derivative of the log of rho. And the rho here goes like x squared, the log, you have the log of x, and then you have the derivative, which gives you 1 over x. So actually the drift field here diverges. And then of course it's continuum periodically. So that would be v of x. And apparently, at least, if you have this kind of random process, it will give you that kind of density, and it gives it will give you an acceleration that is exactly equal to zero. Okay, so that's a simple example. If you were now to go to the harmonic oscillator, you would find interestingly that the drift diffusion process for the ground state is just the onstein Winback process with appropriate constants. Now, I will give a, another example in the numerical simulation, but for the moment, let us just have a look at the diffusion constant again. So remember, d has to be chosen to equal h bar over 2m in order to give the Schrödinger equation. Otherwise, it would just give the Schrödinger equation for a different effective value of h bar, so to speak. Um, you can give a nice meaning to this diffusion constant. 
because on a microscopic level you want to imagine a particle going to the left or to the right randomly and the picture would somewhat look like this. If I turn this into a discrete random walk where I can just make steps uh, upward or downward. Okay, it would look like this. And I would introduce a finite time step Again, let's call it delta t. And of course, I know that uh, delta x squared handle that is just 2 times e times delta t. So that must always be true. But now let me imagine that this particle has its elementary steps where it moves with the velocity of light. plus or minus c times delta t. Then again you can calculate delta x squared and you want to figure out well, how would I have to choose delta t uh, in order to make this diffusion constant correct, namely h bar over 2n. Okay. And the result is that you would need to choose a delta t which is just equal to h bar over mc squared. And now if you think about it, mc squared is the rest energy of such a particle and h bar over mc squared or h over mc squared, I mean up to a factor, this is just the Compton time, the inverse of the Compton frequency. number for an electron mass uh, that would be about I think 10 to the minus 21 seconds. So you can have, if you like, a picture in your mind of a microscopic zitter bewegung at the time scale given by the Compton time, where also quantum mechanics would predict a zitter bewegung. Um, with a particle moving back and forth randomly at the speed of light. And then you would get such a diffusion constant. That in particular depends in this way on the mass. So it doesn't seem too arbitrary. It doesn't seem too random. Even though Nelson doesn't say anything about the microscopic origin of this random walk. But still, this is how the value could come about. Okay. Now, let me then briefly say something about the time-dependent case. I skipped that because uh, technically it was a little bit simpler to just uh, always uh, look at the stationary process. But it turns out that, well, you do have some more freedom in the equations if you have a, not just a stationary process. And let me just write down what results. I want to write it down again for one dimension, it's easy to generalize. Um, and I want to write it down uh, in the continuum limit. So E tilde would be this white noise, fluctuating force, just as before. Plus, there would be the drift term, which we know serves to counteract the tendency to diffuse. So it's again given by the derivative of the log of the density. Plus then, however, there is an extra term. And in principle, it's not known how to choose it. So that's a little bit arbitrary. Nelson assumes simply that this extra term can be expressed as the gradient of something. 
And so let's call the something of which it is a gradient phi. And have a prefactor which happens to be h bar over m. Now, of course, you recognize this term because that is the term that Bohm also suggests. For, for Bohm, this is the only term. Now, here that would occur as an extra term in a time dependent situation where you have phase gradients and so on. extra term, we will still demand that the, that the acceleration field is just given by the gradient of the potential. And then it turns out that again the best way to solve this equation, the resulting equations, is to introduce, so to speak, the wave function psi. That is the square root of O times, well, e to the i phi. And so this extra field that was introduced here to represent the extra term as a gradient, this turns out to be the phase of the wave function. And it turns out that if you write psi in this manner and make this condition, then it fulfills the time dependent schrodinger So that is also quite remarkable. Again, this equation of motion looks like warm plus noise, which would lead to diffusion, plus some term that counteracts the noise. Even if you, so imagine a wave packet that is moving, even if you didn't have the Boomian term, the combination of these two terms always wants to make the density uh, stick close to the prescribed density. So if I were to insert here instead of O psi squared, I would be guaranteed that I'm always relatively close uh, to psi squared with my ensemble density. Um, but there would always be a time lag of my ensemble particles following the wave packet. And the Bohmian term just makes sure that everything is all right. Yeah? Because the Bohmian term by itself would already guarantee that uh, my ensemble density follows psi squared. And this then only leads to a zitter bewegung that doesn't change the story. Okay, well, uh, now this is the time for a movie, I guess. Okay, now what I did here is simulate the same equation that we already looked at for Bohm's theory. That is, I just have two wave packets. Either you can interpret them as the wave packets of one particle in two dimensions or of two particles, each of them in one dimension. And I generate an ensemble of particles, of course in each one of the experiment, only one of them is supposed to be present. And then they follow um, the equation according to Bohm's theory. So the first example is um, something where the wave packets move strictly on the horizontal axis, which would be the position of particle one, if you think of two particles. And so it's a product state. Again, you are expecting to see an interference pattern when the wave packets meet. And now just watch and try to judge the difference with respect to Bohm's theory. There's always this zeta bewegung going on. have seen it. So at every point in time the density of the ensemble matches the psi squared. Um, now this is something where the wave packets are also moving in the vertical direction. And if 
these are two particles, you know that just means we have an entangled state. I mean, that's the same setup we discussed for Boom. Maybe I can show it again. So you also see that the diffusion is a very slow process, of course. Actually, the time it takes to, for a particle to diffuse across the extent of the wave packet is about the time it takes the wave packet to spread in quantum mechanics by about its own size due to the uncertainty in the moment. And now we can have a look at the trajectories. So for example, this would be the trajectory of particle one. What you see is, well, the Zitterbewegung. You also see two trajectories that are highlighted in red, uh, where one of them somehow moves along with its initial wave packet, so to speak, always moves to the right, and another one then switches direction of motion and starts to move to the left. So this can happen. Now that is uh, particle number one, and remember, um, we apply the force to particle number one. You might also wonder how does particle, how do particles two, the trajectories of particle two look like, and that is shown here. That is only in the time interval where the wave packets actually cross. You can't readily tell what we had been able to tell easily for Bohm's theory, where we saw that if you apply a force to particle one, something happens definitely to the trajectories of particle two. You can't see that on this plot, but you would be able to see it if you extend it to longer times, because then you would see a situation similar to what we have seen for particle number one, namely that in the absence of a force on particle one, particle two trajectories always say go to the right preferentially or always go to the left. There are these two kinds of trajectories. But if you do something to particle one, then suddenly for particle two there are also trajectories that can flip the average sign of their velocity and first go right and then go left. So definitely, again, by looking at what happens to a particle two, you can tell whether someone has done anything to particle number one even though particle number one may be very far apart, even though there may be no interaction between them. And so in this sense, uh, also Nelson's theory is non-local. And it has to be non-local because, again, it correctly predicts everything that quantum mechanics predicts, at least for position measurements at one given moment in time. And so if you take Bell's theorem seriously and apply it here, it must be non-local. Okay, so the first remark again is that Nelson's theory is also non-local. Again in the sense that we defined uh, last time, that is, influences acting purely on particle one will have an instantaneous effect onto the trajectories of particle two, even if there's no interaction and they're very far apart. Um, for that reason, Nelson himself abandoned uh, his theory, uh, once he was told by John Bell about Bell's theory, actually. And so he even came up himself with a very nice example of what apparently, a very nice example, a striking example of what can go wrong. And so the example he had did not even appear to just looking at the trajectories, because there you could always make the claim, well, these trajectories are unobservable. Yeah? So maybe it's not so bad if they. Uh, seem to have these non-local influences. But what he looked at is an even more striking example, namely where you do just measurements on the positions of particle one and particle two, 
and you find a contradiction with standard quantum mechanics. And the trick is that you don't do these measurements at the same time, but you do them at different times. If you do them at the same time, the structure of the theory guarantees you that you always get the right probability density that matches quantum mechanics and nothing can go wrong. But if you do the measurements at different times, things start to go wrong. So the example he gives, for example, you have two harmonic oscillators, they are very far apart, there is no interaction between them, but you don't just prepare each of them in their ground state, that would be boring, that would be a product state, but instead, um, if I draw the x1 and x2 plane, particle position 1 and particle position 2, you prepare them in an entangled state, meaning instead of having the product state, which may be represented by the circle, you have initial correlations between x1 and x2. And now, suppose they have the same frequency, what happens is that, since this is not an eigenstate of the system, it's time dependent, it, it oscillates, for example, there will be times when it goes like this. But, periodically, it comes back to the same wave function, and then there are correlations in this manner. So if x1 is positive, also x2 very likely is positive, and if x1 is negative, also x2 very likely is negative. And in standard quantum mechanics, it's very easy to figure out what is the correct result of a measurement that you do on particle position 1 at some time and particle position 2 at another time. You would just take, say, the initial state and then take the expectation value of um, something like this, x 2 of t minus some value x2 and x1, say at time 0, minus some value x1. So this is a measurement taken at two different times, but it's still just a position measurement. And it turns out that quantum mechanically, due to this periodicity, you find these nice correlations between x1 and x2, not only if I set t equals 0, which would mean simultaneous measurement, but also periodically at all later times. But in Bohm's theory, even if initially there were these correlations, then later on every, excuse me, in Nelson's theory, even if initially there were these correlations, due to the diffusion, they will be washed out for later times. And so, this is one of the examples where the trajectories that are supposed to at least give you correctly the measurements of position don't give the correct answer. Now the same is even true for, uh, for Ohm's theory. And there is a way to fix it, but it's a little bit disappointing. Namely, you can, instead of just saying my measurement is described by just taking the position of my particle according to Ohm's or Nelson's theory, and that's the result, you can say, no, I have to simulate the full measurement process. I have to simulate not only my particle, but also the measurement apparatus, the fluorescent screen, again in the confines of the same Bohm's or Nelson's theory, again with the help of the wave function. If you do this, then once you do your measurement of the first particle, you will really change the whole wave function, and that will make these non-local influences operate, which magically will see to it that the later measurement also comes up. Uh, but this is, of course, a little bit disappointing because the whole point was that at least with regard to position measurements, you should not have to introduce all the quantum mechanical formalism, but rather you just look at where the trajectories are. And so that is um, the status of these theories. Yeah. So they, they work for equal time measurements of all the coordinates in your system. They break down even if you only want to measure the coordinates at different points in time. And on the level of the trajectories, you have the non-local influences of that. Okay. So that's it for today.